I agree with you. That's the point. So we try not to put clean water in dirty cups, but don't tell us nobody can drink water from a dirty cup. That's all I was saying. The, my point was, don't say that God cannot pour water into a dirty cup. If the only cup available to serve people with is dirty, God will pour it in because he wants to save people. Are you listening? I'm not sure that person understood. Whoever asked that question, I'm not sure you understood the point. The point was that some people say God can never use a dirty vessel. And I say it's a lie. He has used many times. We just talked about Peter. Someone can be deficient and God still uses them. And I now told you that's why I emphasize on becoming a clean cup. Because Jesus said, first make the inside of the cup clean and the outside will be clean also. So why I overemphasize? I don't think it's overly. I think it's correct. It's balanced. I emphasize being clean. It's so when God pours in his spirit, his water, his power, you don't defile the cup. I hope this is clear. You don't defile the cup. Let the water come in clean and go out clean. In all those years, in my own life, because I spent so many years cleaning the inside of my cup, I still struggle till today. I normally, if you read my Bible study notes, you see all of it was personal. It's later I understood why people don't change much. I realized after years that when people read the Bible, they keep seeing something to tell someone. But I spent 20 years, more than 20 years, everything I read, I was looking at myself. It was so bad that God had to teach me. God took away my, I think it's God, took away my personal Bible study life. I remember praying these prayers. I, I said, I said, I would pray and say God should help me not to be self-centered. I was self-centered with the word of God. Everything I read, if you read it, I'll say you should not you. You see the language you. You, 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 you. In my devotion books. I was always scrubbing myself. All the water life that came, I pointed at flushing my inner most being. I struggled when officially I had to serve others. Because now I had to turn the water and point it at others. When he will speak to me in my room, till today, I still struggle. Is this for? I automatically think he's talking to me till it becomes a conference. You don't understand. And again, <laughs> this is one of the advantages of being a preacher earlier. Now, I was not a, a, an, an active and consistent preacher early enough. So when I get things, because I'm so used to that thing being me taking that God is speaking to me. Things have come to pass that are international. And when we got it, I thought it was for me. I, I did it with God's house too now. Almost everything we have, we think is us. Till we read it in the papers. Meanwhile, many other ministries, once they hear something, they declare it to the whole earth. It's for the whole world. In fact, it's everywhere except their church. But if you've been here for a couple of years, you notice constantly you hear us stand i don't know if this what you know it's recently we started saying okay let's share words with the rest of the world maybe it's for them too that's exactly how i lived personally everything i read every revelation i thought it was for me i'm thinking god is rebuking me he's correcting me he's telling me you need to sit up here you need to don't be envious it's just that sometimes i'll sit there and struggle but envy who do i envy i don't envy anybody who could i possibly be envy then I realized it's for you. I mean, you, you guys. <laughs> you guys have MV problems. <laughs> so so that's, that's a bit of what um, happened with me. When this conference was called Postal Education, I mean, I was on my knees some days ago, and, and I got all this stuff. It's like, it's like, I mean, and someone had a prophet who was saying to me, it's very funny, if you see, when I, I wrote the title and sent it to a graphic artist to design, I wrote there on the page, I wrote there John, James, Peter. Where's Amarachi? You saw it, right? I didn't tell you, someone, I don't know who, I saw a prophetic word yesterday and the person said, I saw John, I saw Peter, I saw. So that person does not think they are the one that told me what to. I got you at the beginning. You just confirm. You're prophetic. Feel good. <laughs> I'm giving you 10 seconds to feel good. After that, drop it. 
Yeah, normal human being. <laughs> you know, you have to learn to be able to receive assurance. Wow, God spoke to me and drop it fast. Ah, years ago, I read about how some people, so a man, someone traveled somewhere and the person that was driving him was looking a bit sober. And they say, he said, what's wrong? He said, oh. I was rebuked because I raised a dead person some days ago and I think he was getting to my head, so I had to. <laughs> hey, you have not raised a dead bird. <laughs> a dead bird. <laughs> he raised a dead person. It was one of these South American countries. And it says that like, it's getting into your head. So a prophetic word came. Like, is this thing getting into your head? So he had to, he had been repenting. About almost allowing it get to his head that he raised a dead person. Us. Hey. Hey. <laughs> you remember this guy? As though your clothes started getting tighter since something happened. <laughs> Nothing where you do. You just prayed. You laid hands on three people. Two fell. Bah. <laughs> you mean they kept a seat for me? The same color of seat with the rest of <laughs> Huh? Hey. Lack of respect for a person of power. What shall you do in the days that shall come? I've told you, wind will carry you. Because power, you shall see you. Oh, you shall see power. <laughs> you see power, you have problems. And that's part of the challenge of your generation. Because of the time, the end of the age we are in, you're going to see the power of God move. And why do I stress being founded on the rock? Learning the word, having others that fear the Lord. I stress it so much because when you see the grace of God move a bit, there's a great temptation to become heady and not listen and start saying things like, in your mind, do, do, they, do they know who I am? Or am I their mate? And start saying things like, their levels. You start saying all sorts of things. You better know with levels come devils. So if you didn't learn to fight the enemy from the lower levels up, and you just jumped up, and you encounter higher level devils, you're gone, oh. you are guaranteed gone because demonic powers <laughs> we've told the stories you've heard it they will when they pull your file they say what is that making a, g- give me a file the, this thin file is it this small file that is making noise how many pa- two pages <laughs> born again baptizing the holy spirit second June. 2021 Weaknesses, the rest, three pages. <laughs> what? Is this? Who, who, who is the ruling? Who is the principality over sector? Blah, blah, blah. Is it? You allow this thing, make noise. I'll deal with you later. Where is the... Power, where's the print? Where's the spirit assigned? Oh, okay. So, you guys don't walk again, you don't walk, you don't do your job, you know. And Satan is very dangerous. Now, I'm not saying things come your far come to certain face soon. No, you have to, it will take time before your far can come to his face. But if by any chance he gets to the level of anyone's face, that is how you're hit with temptations you cannot comprehend. And then you start asking unnecessary questions. Now, you know the funny thing? I was telling you this thing years ago. Some of you, after I told you, it still happened. You're here now. I won't ask you to raise your hands. Is there someone that doesn't believe? You want to see the hands? I'm asking. Is there someone that says, no, I want to see if there are people like that. I can tell them to raise their hands. They will raise it. Even after I warned you for years, it still happened as I spoke. Why did it happen? Because you didn't pay attention. But it's okay. Take it as part of your learning process. 
Focus way more on your feet than on your big head. It can pull you down. Focus more on planting your feet in deep rock because that is what matters. Now I'm baptized. I'm full of the Holy Ghost. Yay. Hey, oh, oh, oh. Shanda, move, move, move. You think you're Spider Man? <laughs> if you're careless, you're reckless. You don't learn from the best. Remember, you are to abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight that you may learn to discern what is best. We are teaching apostolic education is the best. What Peter, James, John teach you, Paul, is the best education. You must be pure and blameless if you will stand. They can twist any of your weaknesses, any. They'll take it and apply pressure. So I focus more on finding you and purging you of all those weaknesses. That's the emphasis of cleaning the inside. Let's get rid of all those weaknesses. Because those weaknesses is where, have you seen in movies where they shoot someone? A bullet wound. And then they are trying to torment you and they put their finger. That's what Satan does. That's exactly what he does. It's a very simple strategy. Apply pressure where it hurts the most. So if you are all full of low self-esteem or you are living in fear or you are, you know, struggling with rejection, you notice all the years God worked on the people in this church thoroughly, so many levels and layers of freeing, being purged and freed from all sorts of things. I'm only sad when I think some of you don't seem to understand even why. You still, you know how you can cooperate with the process. You have to cooperate with the process. When the time comes and you run out there and the Lord kicks you out to do his will, the enemy will apply pressure there. He will. It's what he does. We haven't learned to master your sexual impulses. You're dead. You're gone. He puts one scandal in your life. He puts two. It won't be a scandal yet because you don't have an impact. But once you have some significance, he calls the wall press around and prints out the pictures. It's what he does. It's what he will do. It's what Satan does. So you must learn your lessons. You must be purged and purified. It's warfare. I want to show you something on warfare. Third question, please. What's the difference between an apostle and an evangelist? An evangelist is an announcer of good news. He goes out and spreads good news. An apostle is a layer of foundations. It's not as simplistic as you want, but he lays foundations. I took time to explain what an apostle will do. I didn't give as much detail because I didn't open the passage, the Bible, and show you. But understand that apostles begin things. They are pioneers. They start things. An evangelist can be anywhere. Paul is telling Timothy, a teacher and a pastor, he's telling him, do the work of an evangelist. In season and out of season. Then he tells him, reprove, rebuke, exhort. Now, you won't think of that when you're thinking of an evangelist. Because most times people give the impression an evangelist just pulls people to God. But no, the work of an evangelist goes beyond that. The work of an evangelist will help put people in order. And it will equip people to press on into God's intentions constantly. He tells him in the book of chapter, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, Verse 2. Well, verse 1 first says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and encourage with every form of patient instruction. Tells him that. 
every form of patient instruction. Then in verse 5, he says, But be sober in all things, and your hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. All right, so if you mix all of that, you preach the word, reprove, rebuke, and exhort, encourage. Second Timothy 4, verse 1 to 5. I think that's it, the three questions. I can answer others on other days, she's not ready. I want to show you something quickly, something you should carry in your mind for these days we are here. Everyone should carry. In the book of Numbers chapter 31, Numbers 31, I'm reading from the first verse. If you're writing, you can write all the way down to verse 24. And the Lord said to Moses, take vengeance on the Midianites for the Israelites. After that, you'll be gathered to your people. That means you'll die. The Lord said to Moses, take vengeance. Who knows why God was taking vengeance? Who doesn't know? Okay, so what happened is that the Midianites had sent in their women. Remember that time Balaam was hired to curse the Israelites? His curse did not work. He tried multiple times, killing seven oxen on seven altars. None worked. Finally, he kept blessing them as the Holy Spirit, God told him to. And when he left there, Balak, was angry with him. I told you to curse them and he came and blessed them. He was so greedy. Remember how I ended yesterday? The love of money, the love of money, the love of money. Made, the Bible says he made the prophet mad. Till today, he makes prophets mad. Number one reason, someone that has the word of the Lord coming to him and through him begins to go berserk in every wrong direction is money, not the love of money. It's the easiest way. The most effective servant of God. The only really effective servant of God is the one who has been freed from the love of money. If I see a servant of God, I don't care how big or popular you are. You like money. I know you're crooked. I know there will be many things wrong with you and they have never proven me wrong. The ministry, the overseer, will always have significant spiritual and moral issues because that's the nature of mammon. Now, what did... Balaam do because of his love of money. He went to those people and still offered them a way for God to punish them. We've learned this in the book of Revelation chapter 2. Jesus tells us. We learn it in the book of Jude. We learn it in the book of 2 Peter chapter 2. We learn it in the book of Numbers between chapter 23 and 4 and down. And here. Because you see them kill him. He was killed. God made sure they killed him. He went and advised that king. He said, you cannot curse them directly. They are covered. The sound of the king is among them. What you will do is get them to kill themselves. And how do you do that? The rule has never changed. Get them to sin. Just get them to sin. Just plant sin and water it in their midst. Their God will kill them. It's a perfect strategy. It has not failed to work yet. So they did. They sent their women, Midianite women, who went and seduced them and invited them. They couldn't stop them. They invited them to their feasts, their occasions, on the plains of Moab, just before the Jordan and the Promised Land. These guys were on the boundary of entering Promised Land. And they started. God killed 24,000 of them. God himself. He handled it. He told Moses to help him kill some. The heads. Say, so bring them up. Hang them. So the untouchable people were touched by none other but their God. And the people that facilitated it was Midian and Moab. Are you hearing this? So this is God later saying, Moses, you do one more thing for me before you check out. 
Remember, you're not entering. As I promised. You take out the media nights for me. And what follows is what I would call the ideal format for warfare. God directed warfare. Executed according to instruction. Let me show you what happens. Something beautiful that happens when you are carrying out warfare according to the will of God. It's not in the portion I gave you to read. So, chapter, verse 48 and 49. 48 to 50. Let me just show you something useful, something sensible. This is after the battle. Then we go back. Then the officers who were over the units of the army, the commanders of thousands and of hundreds, approached Moses and said, your servants have counted the soldiers under our, under our command. Read. And not, not one of us is missing. is missing. Oh, you didn't understand. This guy fought a full battle and not one person died. Mm. Where did it happen? How? How is that possible? It happened. Each of them called back their soldiers. They counted present, present, present. Not one person was missing. They must have counted again. They, they were confused. They must have gotten confused. Who goes to one? There's no fatality. When you slaughtered all the other side. How? Moses did not expect it. Nobody expected it. But it happened. It's when they took a roll call. Everyone was present. And what was their response? This is the lesson to take from it. First. No, wait. Look at me. First point is that you should know it's possible to go to one. There's no fatality. Yes, sir. Are you hearing? Because it's written. Yes, a group of people, a church group can go out and do God's will constantly and come back and nobody drops. Nobody goes back to the world. The devil does not take down anyone. Doesn't take out anyone. It is possible. How? We just read it. So for those of you that say they must always be, why must they always be? They mustn't always be. They must not always be. When this church group began a, a, a leadership structure in 2016, 17, January, the Lord picked eight leaders, the core leaders, the first set, what we call the eight. All of them are standing in the Lord. All of them. None of them have fallen away. That's something. In the second batch, one fell. Two? One. One. Second group, the 12. One fell away. <laughs> Out of 12. Do I need to? <clears throat> Maybe I should have made it 12. You should have made it 11 or 10. Or... <laughs> Maybe that's our fault. <laughs> but they have stood. They have survived. The enemy has not found victory over us. One was fulfilling prophecy. Verse 50. So we have brought to the Lord an offering of the gold articles each man acquired. So to make atonement for ourselves before the Lord. To make atonement is like, God, on behalf of my life that you have given me, I'm giving you this, you know. So they, 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 they taught you something that might be wise. That you should recognize the preservation of the Lord. It is wisdom to acknowledge God's preservation, that you are still a child of God. Your faith is still alive. You have not shipwrecked your faith. You have not sunk in the depths of worldliness and the ways of this world. It is wise to be appreciative. Always it's wise. All right, go back to verse 1, 2. The Lord sent him to go and take vengeance against the Midianites because God is a God of vengeance. Vengeance is mine, I'll repay. You can go and read Romans chapter 12 and you'll see where he talks about vengeance. God has no qualms about avenging. Oh, for those of you that think, no, God will avenge. I showed you that already in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 where he said it's God's will to afflict those who have afflicted you, but it's a matter of timing. Are you hearing me? Yes. For those of you that are so gross, you're meant to forgive anyone that hurts you and everyone. Ask God to forgive them and show them mercy. That's it. When it's time to avenge, let God handle that. It's not your duty to go around shouting, God, avenge me, avenge me. 
Especially if you think you're a person. Rather, you can ask for vengeance against Satan. Are you hearing me? Yes, sir. Yeah, so God is a God of vengeance. Have no doubt about it. Any other teaching is false. God doesn't mind avenging. If you look at Romans 12, verse 19, it says, do not avenge yourselves, beloved, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Okay? Deuteronomy 32, verse 35. Right, right, right. Don't open, right. Deuteronomy 32, verse 35 is what he was quoting. Vengeance is mine, I'll repay. In due time, you see, he said, in due time, their foot will slip. For their day of disaster is near and their doom is coming quickly. One of the things I think is happening, because when I was praying today, I was seeing this, I was seeing this. I think there's vengeance around the corner. I don't know who, I don't know what, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. But I think there's vengeance around the corner because I've kept saying this. I think vengeance is coming. Hey, it's a bad time to, it's not a good time to vex God. It's not a good time. Hebrews 10.30, vengeance for him. We know him who said, vengeance is mine, I'll repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. The Lord will judge his people. Take note, it is people he will judge. All those that say, my God can never. Who? Who? By the way, if you know that Hebrews chapter, he was talking to his people, he was threatening them. Okay, I'll go to the verse before. That's Hebrews 10.30. When God threatens you, how much more severely do you think one deserves to be punished who has trampled on the Son of God, made common or profaned the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and insulted the spirit of grace? He's talking to people who called on Jesus' name. I had a word two days ago, three, and I called someone and, sent, and told them that God needs them to repent. And they answered, I don't believe in judgment. I don't believe in. I'm saying it's so it to be on video, audio record. That happened two days ago. I think. So in the future, where it happens, I'll tell you. I, I think that person is about to enter Yahweh. What they think. Do not seek. So this is talking about people because I, I was, the Lord had just finished speaking to me about what it means to trample on his, his blood. It's someone that has received Jesus, then you trample him. This is not, oh, you sin, you stumble. No, this is you spitting on I don't want anything to do with you. I don't believe in you. You're nothing. Oh, you're really looking for trouble. He said he'll judge his people. Leviticus 19. Uh, no, 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 no. Don't write that. Leave it. Leave. I've given you enough. If you want more, go to Jeremiah chapter 50. Look at the judgment of Babylon. It's very long. It's, it's a lot. All right. So back to where we were. Where were we? Where? Numbers 31 verse. <sighs> Write down verse 3. I'm giving you breakdown. So first of all, God avenges. Principles of warfare. The perfect war model. God takes vengeance. But he takes it in his own time. Do you understand this? Yes. Verse 3. So Moses told the people, arm some of your men for war. That they may go against the Midianites and execute the Lord's vengeance on them. God uses people sometimes to carry out that vengeance. Are you hearing me? Before those people can be used, they must be armed. That means they must be given arms. That's weapons of war. God has, because of time, I would have given you, I would have given you scriptures, I would have opened up and shown you how the Bible has that God says He's bringing weapons out of His armory. It's in, it's in, um, it's in Jeremiah chapter 50. God has an armory. He brings out weapons from there. Store. If you read the book of Job, he told you he has a store. He, call, he calls his armory a storehouse too. Hellstones are part of God's armory. When he opens it, he hammers cities. He hammers people. Sometimes when you see hellstones, not the light ones, the ones that destroy and kill people. It's God. He's angry. Mm, he, it's a real thing. You should know it. In the days to come on this earth, you see sometimes God will say, point your hands, pray about a place. You pray and there will be hellstones there. And there will be judgments all over. That's a real thing. That's a real thing. One of those days, I think the last time I mentioned hellstones here, I said it and he held it. It was a, a hell. Hell fell in Joss. Yes, remember? That same day. But I don't think it was destructive. There's those tiny things. There's these big ones like this. But that's when God, so God has armory. Now God arms people. He gives you weapons. He equips you to 
carry out his vengeance when it is time for vengeance. And the primary thing he does is the sword. Jeremiah 50, the sword, the sword. What's the sword? The sword is the word of God. The word of God in your lips. The word of God written down and redeclared according to the leading of the spirit. That's what makes it a sword. How do I know? Written down is not necessarily living, but the word of God is living and powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. So it comes and it pierces, it divides, it separates. All right. So he said, take some of your people, equip them. When you're being equipped with the word of God and the truth, it is not for the sake of lying down in your bed. It's for the sake of carrying out God's vengeance. Are you hearing me? Good. Now the Bible says, send into battle a thousand men from each tribe. Next principle. So you must be armed. And then the next principle is that it's not everybody that goes to every battle. Soldiers are not always comprised of every existing soldier representational warfare is allowed, okay? You saw when we were praying for Nigeria, the NMPG group, 12 to 17 people were selected by the leading of the Holy Spirit and they prayed for Nigeria for a total of 90 days at different periods, representing the church. And that it was received, that, that's warfare. So they went to war on behalf of the church. And um, so he said send. So it's not every battle that you need everybody. All right? Keep going. 12,000 men armed for what? 12,000. 12, the number of apostleship. 12, the number of patriarchs. 12, the number of leadership. You know? So 12,000. One for 1,000. 1,000 for one. And they represented. So this is the power of leadership. It's why God picks leaders. God picks leaders. One reason why you must... Pray for your leadership. In this church, make sure you do wherever you are. Make sure you uphold the leadership of the congregation where you are. Because they often will represent you. Those who spend their time fighting the leadership God has given them are most unwise. You ought to be holding up the hands of those that lead you. Obey those who rule over you. Be submissive. They watch out for your soul. This is how they watch out for your soul. They go and meet the enemy on your behalf. If not, the enemy will meet you. So those who represent are to be honored for their labor. You are told that you should give honor to those who teach you, who labor in the word, especially those who labor in the word and teaching. Why did he say so? Because the word is a sword. Those who go to battle on your behalf, as I'm preaching, when a preacher, a teacher is bringing forth the word, that's the sword at work. It's cutting you free. It's attacking ways of thinking out of place. It's warfare happening. It represents, why don't all of us stand up and start talking at each other at once? God always picks leaders. He always has leadership because they fight battles in representational capacities. Is this clear? Principles of warfare. He sent them along with Phinehas, son of Elias, at the priest. So a priest goes along with them. What's a priest duty? The book of Malachi tells you it's to teach, to teach the law, understanding when you have questions. You need discernment. You go to the priest. The priest, one who understands the things of the spirit. One that has been set apart to understand should accompany those who go to war. If you go to war without knowledge and depth of insight, your chances of being defeated are high. Again, what happened to many people, even in this house, that transforms their lives, even though many said they were born again before they came here. What's the major thing that led to the transformation? You have a teaching priest. You have understanding. As understanding came, strength came. Because a wise man is strong. A man of understanding increases strength. So strength comes from understanding. Knowledge makes a man's face to shine. Strength comes from understanding. So they took a priest along. They didn't relax and say, don't worry, we can do it. We don't need anybody. Mm -mm. They listened to what the priest would say. The priest is set apart. Holy unto the law was written on the high priest's headband, bonnet. Because his job, he's set apart for a purpose. That act of being separated from, you know, I've spoken in the past why many servants of God, even preachers, struggle a lot, even with the work God has given them, and they can't have a healthy spiritual congregation because many are too busy. They are busy engrossed in so many things. Going to work till five, then going to rush and be a part-time pastor of, what do you expect? When, uh, the, by its very, by the, the concept of priesthood is separation. Priests and Levites are separated people. 
They are not mixed in with everybody. When you're mixed in with everybody, when and where on earth will you hear from heaven? When will the heavens open over you and rain comes that you can impart? It's not there. So one of the most important things God needs are people who are dedicated much more time, much more attention to hearing the Lord. Then when you go with such people to battle, your chances of victory are way higher. A priest or a prophet, they came, is there no prophet here? They said there's one. There's Elisha, son of Shaphat, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. Call him now and he comes there. Within how long? You have an instrumentalist. Bang, 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 bang. Dig ditches. Simple. The battle is won. The beauty of having someone that is set apart. Many do not understand. You take it for granted. You're just like, well, I knew what it. When you had no clue, or if you have no clue, you are defeated. The same battle. When they spoke to Jehoshaphat, they put singers in front of them and priests. When Joshua went forth to war, they put Priests in front, as they marched around Jericho, playing instruments, bing, 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 bing. they just walked around a city and the walls fell. Walls that were as wide as this room. Just walking around. Wider, it was 22 feet and 15. Nine and 15, 22 feet total. Uh, that's not even correct. At one was about 15, one was 20, uh, nine feet wide. They found it. It's, it's in the ground somewhere. So it's not, I'm not guessing. Immense war. They walked around. Then priests walked and blew trumpets. Then everyone shouted. The walls came down. That's what when you have the leadership, spiritually adept leadership, battles become easy and victory becomes much more assured. Is this clear? But he didn't just go by himself. The priest is the one who carried around other vessels of the holy place, the sanctuary. So you carry along other holy things, holy people, holy properties, things that you that are from the holy place. What's in the holy place? You have the golden lampstand, the light, what I already said. You have the incense altar. You have the table of showbread, the bread of, 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 of the Lord's table. When you carry along obedience to these things, looking for light in the word of God, Offering acceptable incense when you carry these things to battle. Not, you know, it's not physical. I've explained. The light of truth. You carry to battle. Victory is assured. And he also took trumpets. Trumpets are for sounding, for signaling. It's time. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Prophetic counsel and direction. These are the things they took to war. I think I've made the point I was trying to make. And when they got there, you can read. They wage war against Midian. As the Lord had commanded Moses, and they killed every male. Males to reproduce the ones that have the ability to seed. They provide seed, and there's replication. They are seed banks. So you must take out anything that has the ability to replicate when you go to war. What's a woman? The ability to receive and carry seed, incubate, and bring to fruition. It's neutral. It's whoever gives her seed that she carries. But the men are dangerous in that they will pass down their name and their tendencies into that womb, any womb. So they had to remove all the men. What is a boy? Go and read it. They killed all the boys too because boys are just potential men. Okay, so same thing. What, have, what does this mean in our life? When you go to war, take note of those that have the ability to continue seeding. It's not physical warfare, it's spiritual. Anything in Warfare, anything you come across that has the ability to increase and replicate that which you don't want to continue. Example, the Midianites, you must take them out. Is this clear? You must take them out. You must wipe them out. Don't be nice. Don't leave it behind. That which has the ability to continue. It's why they are named. When, you, when you're in a proper church like ours, we will tell you, eh? who was this person to you? Delete the number. Block it. Block first, then delete. People will say, what, what's that? Why would you do that? Is that not too extreme? You're joking with a male. No, no, we've never had anything. You have the capacity to have. He's a boy. He will plant seed soon. And next thing you start talking all sorts of funny things. No, I, well, I, mean, I think... <laughs> you make the same sounds we have heard so many times. 
I'm always amused when people show up and think they are the first to sing a song. Meanwhile, this is an old song. We've heard it for years and it ends in one way. We've seen where that song goes to. It ends in one way. They always, then they appear. I don't even know what was wrong with me. What is wrong with you? You're very stupid. Don't sing your song here. We told you before you recorded the, the, the song. Get, don't do that thing. Don't do that. Some people can't laugh because of what has happened to them. No. Yeah, yeah. You know, we said they talk for a person, but then they're here downstairs. They, maybe they are more there. All over. It's a job of those God gives to lead you to give you direction. Don't despise them. They might yet save your life because they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Do you see reason to appreciate leadership? Yes, sir. Yeah, you have leadership that hears God. Appreciate it. The Lord will be with us. Amen? Amen. Father, we are thankful. I want you to stand to your feet.